at GBS again. And uh, years ago, I told the Lord if He opened the door for me to go to Bible schools, any of them, that I would do my best to go. And I've been allowed to be here two or three times. And I appreciate getting to be back again. It's good to see all of you. Some of you I don't recognize really at this moment. Uh, because I can't see your whole face, but uh, perhaps that could be a blessing in disguise in some ways. I'm just kidding. All right, let's look tonight to the book of Luke for a verse or two of Scripture. Thank you, Brother Loper, and those that are in charge. And uh, I'm going to do my best just to mind God while I'm here. We want to have a great time. We want to see the Lord come. And we want you to get help. I want to get help. And I've just got to be honest with you. Every time I come here, I'm the one that gets the help. I go away feeling much better than when I came. And so it's good to be back on these hallowed grounds again in this uh, very historic tabernacle. The book of Luke chapter 4, 14 tonight. I want to just read a couple verses. Luke 14, 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said unto him, we're talking about Jesus now, these are the words in red, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready and they all with one consent begin to make excuse I'm going to stop the reading there turn to the book of revelation chapter 22 and i'll read verses 16 and 17 i jesus he's talking again i jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches i am the root and offspring of david and the bright and morning star, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And I want to use this for my thought tonight. Come, for all things are now ready. Heavenly Father, we're so glad to be back in this historic tabernacle tonight. So many times you have come here and blessed and helped in days gone by. You have sent students out from this hill, this hilltop so many years now. We're thankful for the heritage of GBS and for everyone that's come and gone from this hilltop. But now here's a new group of people, never been assembled quite like they are, before this year and in this semester and early now in this semester we come to you tonight asking you to touch every one of the students and every one of the faculty and the visitors that are here and those that will watch online tonight and later on we pray that you'll come and help us by your great and mighty power and we'll praise you in Jesus name Amen some time ago, I read a beautiful story that I want to preface this little message with tonight. It is told that in the history of England, Queen Elizabeth was coming to visit a great castle. It was owned by a rich and powerful lord, and all of the clocks in the towers of the castle were stopped at the moment of the Queen's arrival, as so to continue to point to the greatest hour the castle had ever seen. The clocks were never restarted, and even to this day, they are still pointing at the moment of the castle's greatest hour when the queen came to visit. The doors of the great hall were opened, and she uh, came in to the sound of trumpets. Four hundred servants were employed to wait on all the guests that had invite, been invited. She was greeted that night by torches and fireworks, and the night was ablaze, uh, booming cannons, and much music uh, was employed that night to make it a great night. It seemed that it was one moment of joy followed after another. 
It was a banquet that never ended. When one group had dined and were filled, another group would be brought in and the feast would go on. It went on for days and days at the cost of $5,000 a day. And as we think about that uh, beautiful meal and all that went on with that meal tonight, I want to tell you about something that's more grand than that meal. I want to invite you to something tonight that the Lord Himself is the host of. And the angels of God are the cupbearers. And the redeemed of all the ages are the guests of honor. Uh, the great halls of eternal love are ablaze with light and paved with joy. The music is the harmony of all of the ages. Every song is from the throats of the redeemed. The tables are loaded with good things of the very best that heaven affords. There is a golden plate on the table with a name card by it with your name on it. There is a golden chalice that stands by every plate. Uh, and I myself uh, are in, uh, have been invited and I've accepted the invitation. Hallelujah! But in your hand tonight perhaps is an invitation as well. You need to break the seal on that invitation tonight. The letterhead bears the seal of the Lamb of God. Uh, and the letter reads, All come for all things are now ready. At times past, great expectations have happened uh, and a great host of people have arrived uh, with their expectations fully realized. Uh, but the final results uh, are left with the guests with a feeling that the whole thing uh, maybe didn't really amount to a whole lot. Uh, and I'm talking now about places we've been invited to in the past, other invitations that you've received. Uh, and, and I've been to places that I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But when I got there, it wasn't very good at all. I, I think that it wasn't meeting my expectations. Uh, and I don't know what it was. It may have been the table arrangements or the decorations that were quite not quite right. The timeliness of the food, uh, getting ready, perhaps uh, the various things that went on, the singing or the music, or the host didn't seem too receptive, or something was a little off and not quite right. Uh, but we walk all around this banquet, uh, and I want to tell you tonight, after eating the first and second courses, uh, when the founder of the feast arrives, uh, every guest rises uh, and cheers him. Uh, we notice tonight that He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, he's arrayed in a vesture of blood. Uh, and His presence and countenance is like lightning. Uh, he's been waiting 2,000 years for you to arrive. While other lords would have shut the door on the latecomers, perhaps, and the feet draggers, if there is such, uh, He tenderly awaits those who have been invited to finally arrive after all. You know, tonight, if we could gather up all the tears that have been cried for you, if we could gather up the blood that was shed for you to hear this invitation tonight, if we could gather up all the groans of the saints who have prayed for you and for this college, if we could gather up the sweat from every brow that's toiled here on the hilltop, if we could harness all the hunger pangs that the people on the back wall have had as they fasted and prayed for this school and for you. As I came in tonight, Brother Dr. Smith, it is now. Uh, Stephen came to me and he said, Oh, Brother Mitchell, I have such fond memories of your parents when they attended the Shelbyville Church. and." We talked about my little mom for a while. And uh, when she passed away, she left 14 prayer books that were completely filled from back to front with names and missions and missionaries and all kinds of things. It was amazing. We laid them all out. We thought we'd brought all of them to the funeral home. 
But when we got back home and began to, to sift through my parents' things, we found boxes more of mom's prayer books. I just want to tell you tonight that a lot of people have had mothers like I did. Some of you had grandmothers like that and mothers. Uh, if we could gather up all of the martyrs of the church, those that have given their very life's blood. Uh, I noticed tonight, though, that it was Jesus. It was His blood that has sealed the invitation that's in your hand. Come, for all things are now ready. It was His agony, and it was His pain, and it was His tears, and it was His sorrow, and finally it was His cry, It is finished. Uh, all that is behind the invitation that you hold in your hand tonight. This is not some dead ritual that's lost its luster. It's not some antique that has no place in today's world but it has the marks of Calvary upon it. It has the glow of the resurrection and the glow of the faces of the redeemed of all the ages and the raptures of heaven and the timelessness of eternity is upon it. It's not an invitation to be tossed aside with the junk mail. But in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus steps forth in this final chapter that I read in your hearing tonight and Jesus says come the spirit says come the bride says come you know this beautiful word come here the Holy Ghost is saying come and, and I want to know tonight why are some sermons seemingly failures why is it that some songs fall flat and there's no heartfelt response. Boy, I had a heartfelt response tonight to these songs, didn't you? When the twins got up and, uh, and he sang this precious song and, and the Lord broke him up. I say hallelujah. I say God interrupt any service you want to and just let his people be praising him. Thank God. And then the other couple that sang, God bless their music as well. Uh, but there are times that it seems that there's no heartfelt response. Uh, some prayers seem only to go to the ceiling and, and fall back to the floor. And why is that? And I, the only reason to know I would have is there is a lack somewhere. These things must be attended to by the blessed Holy Ghost Himself. And if that Spirit that I'm talking about tonight would make its way through this tabernacle here, we would feel something akin to what Saul felt as he was on the Damascus Road on the way to put Christians in prison. There he was riding along by on his high horse but the Holy Ghost and His great power knocked him off of his horse and onto the ground. The Holy Ghost and His power is what we need. If the Holy Ghost would move the way that we need Him to, it would be akin to the time that He got a hold of Lydia, the seller of purple, while she was at her little shop. God, the Holy Ghost got such a hold on her there that she came to Jesus. It would be akin to like being in the upper room with 120 when the Holy Ghost swept in on them and changed them and empowered them forever. It would be akin to the time that that great sermon was preached by Peter when 3,000 stepped from darkness to light at one service and were swept into victory and into joy unspeakable and full of glory. It would be akin to the time uh, that the earthquake shook the prison where Paul and Silas were uh, and, the, and the doors fell off the prison and everybody's bands were loosed uh, and the old jailer came rushing in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We need the Holy Ghost. Have you ever noticed that it's often an insignificant agency that saves a soul? Some years ago, a man was on board 
a ship on the Hudson River. He was handed a gospel tract, and he went on deck during a misty rain, took that tract and tore it into as many little pieces as he could and cast it into the air, into the mist and the rain. He did so with disgust and disdain. What he didn't know was one tiny fragment in that mist and rain and wind came back around and fastened itself to his coat sleeve. On that little scrap of that tract was only one word, and that word was eternity. That man, when he looked down and saw that word upon his sleeve, was instantly smitten by the Holy Ghost and went to his stateroom and there prayed clear through having never known God before. For Martin Luther, it was a few words also, the just shall live by faith as he climbed the steps to kiss the toes of a cement or stone St. Peter. He found something better than that. The just shall live by faith. Augustine had St. Augustine had wasted his young life some time ago, I was in St. Augustine, Florida, and uh, we didn't have very much money. This was a long time ago, I'm going to guess. I don't have much money now. I got more than I had this morning. Have you ever uh, played Monopoly and there's a little card on Community Chess that says, Bank Error in Your Favor? Well, I got a phone call today. The bank had messed up. They put a deposit I had made into someone else's account on August the 20th and they found it today and put it in my account hallelujah it was money I didn't think I had on the 25th of the month I stopped in to see uh, I was going to cash some checks and uh, the lady at the bank said uh, Reverend Mitchell are you going to put some money in today and I said well I can do I need to she said you need to put in $500 I said, what? Well, I put in $500. I didn't know. I thought, well, I don't, I'm not a very good bookkeeper. But, you know, I forgot about it. I was aiming to go home and find out what was going on, but I forgot about it till today. And I'm $800 richer than I was this morning. However, the Papua New Guinea account of the Calvary Bible Wesleyan Church is $800 short. When I went to deposit my check, they put my check right back in the church's account. Wasn't that sweet of them? And it wasn't even in the right account it came out of. It came out of Papua New Guinea, and I happened to be a signer on that account. It's the only account in the whole church that I'm a signer on. And they accidentally put my money there. So I'm a little richer than I was this morning. Augustine had wasted his life. I was in St. Augustine. We were doing everything that was free. We didn't, we didn't have much money. And so we found out there was a free tour of the churches. So we went. And we went to the Presbyterian Church one afternoon. And a lady got up and gave a beautiful talk on the life of St. Augustine. And uh, she told us how that that Augustine's wife, life was wrecked by sin and, and debauchery. And his mother was broken hearted. She had dedicated him to God. And she felt like God wanted to do something with his life. But he wasn't having anything of it. And he decided to go off somewhere. And she despaired for his soul. She begged God not to let him go. She said, oh God, please don't let my boy go there. Don't let him go, don't let him go, don't let him go. But he went. She felt like God had failed her. But it was while he was there that one verse of Scripture arrested his soul. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. While he was gone, 
He thought he was away from his mother's prayers, but he wasn't. One little verse of Scripture arrested him, and he was saved. Jonathan Edwards, the noted preacher of yesteryear, was saved by the verse that says, Now unto him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Another young man was in the balcony of a great church on Thanksgiving Day. His whole family had gone to attend together this Thanksgiving Day service. He wasn't a Christian. He didn't know God. They were just there because his grandparents were members of that church and encouraged the whole family to join them that day before Thanksgiving dinner. This young man decided not to sit with the family. He was completely uninterested in the service. He went into the balcony hoping to just while away his time up there by looking at everybody. And while he was there, the pastor began to read his text on that Thanksgiving morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. The young man said, and later gave this as his testimony, I said to myself, you know, I have never rendered any acceptable offering of thanks to God in my entire life. And as he sat in the balcony that day, he just uttered the words, Lord, I am thine forever henceforth. When he did that, instantly, he said the Holy Ghost fell on him and he was saved standing in the balcony of that great church. I just said all that to say this tonight. The Holy Ghost wants you to come. Great sermons have been preached with no notable results. But when the Holy Ghost connects a message to heart, lightning flashes and things happen. Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands, hands of an Angry God, produced a great and a mighty salvation of souls the day that he gave the sermon. God fell on the crowd. Thousands were saved. Lives were changed forever. In the yesteryears, the pulpits were filled by converted shopkeepers and factory workers and farmers uh, and people that had trades. Uh, and what they did, they sold their earthly goods and put their little bit of belongings in a cardboard suitcase and got on a bus and came to places like GBS. Uh, they'd never been in a big city before. Uh, they didn't know what they were up to, but God did. Uh, and the Holy Ghost brought them here and sent them across the world to change the world. I'm confident what we need tonight is the Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost. He's here tonight. The Holy Ghost is at the door of your heart and He says, Come, come. The bride saying, Come. You know, there are those who say that there is no one who cares for their soul. But the bride of Christ, the church, says, We care. A man stands in a church and he, he's indifferent. We think he's indifferent. He knows he is. It doesn't matter. But someone in the bride looks beyond that indifference, looks beyond that coldness. Someone in the bride pulls on the bell rope of heaven and pulls the glory down on his heart that's been cold and indifferent. And suddenly something happens. Suddenly his heart is strangely warmed. And although he's heard a thousand sermons before, this one is making a connection that never was made in a heart before. He was indifferent till somebody prayed. I want to tell you tonight, it's prayer. The bride saying, come. The bride saying, come. The prayers of the bride are going up straight to the throne tonight. 
and they're saying, Come. In the night, the prayers of the old withered saints and the sleepless workers are ascending to the throne rooms of God, to the lost soul, and those lost souls are being bidden to come. You know, if you start towards Christ and to make a new life with Jesus, you'll be amazed to find that the church, the bride of Christ, is saying, come, we're going to help you make it. Come on, we're going to help you. You know, some people say, oh, the church is full of busybodies. The holiness people are the worst of all. I hear that kind of mess all the time. Oh, the church is full of hypocrites. You hold a standard so high nobody can come up to it. But I want you to know I've lived all my life in the church, and I don't think it's true. It was a glorious church when my family got in. Every season of my life, I have found the church to be a glorious church. My father was a pastor of home mission churches. My dad's name will never be in any of the annals of great men as far as the world's concerned, but he was a great man. There won't be any books written about him except the one that I wrote. And it did sell a thousand copies. Probably would have sold more, but I didn't have the money to have it reprinted. But my father was a home missions preacher. And every little old handful of people he went to pastor, I found somebody in that little handful that knew God. There were people in all those little churches, small as they may have been, that were part of the glorious church. And in every season of my life, somebody in the bride was saying, come on, come on, come on. In my dad's very first pastorate, there was a lady there that played the church piano. And it was a little chapel that had been built onto a two-story house that would seat about 40 if it was full. And up against one of the walls in the front of that little chapel was an upright piano, and this dear saint of God was the church pianist. And one day she came to me and she said, Raleigh, I've put you down to sing on Sunday night next week, and I want you to practice a song, and I want you to be ready to sing, and I'll play for you if you want me to practice with you. Oh, I said, oh, I can't do that. I, I was seven years old. I said, oh, I can't do that. I was so bashful, and I was so scared, and I was so frightened. But she said to me, oh, Raleigh, I believe you can do it, honey, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God will help you do it. Oh, I worried about that all week. I was physically sick. When I don't eat, my little Debbie cakes, I'm sick. But on Sunday night, I got up and held a praise and worship hymnal, shaking like a leaf. I sang my very first special because somebody in the church said, come on, come on, we're going to help you get started. Come on, you can do something for God. Uh, oh, everywhere I go, there's some child that's looking for somebody just to put their arm around them and said, come on now. You need to be a part of the greatest thing that's ever happened, the church of Jesus Christ. One reason why I've held on to the camp, the children's camp so long, oh my, I'm way too old and out of shape to do it anymore. But for 26 years, we've operated the ICHA children's camp. And I, I preached all 26 of those years, three times a day to a bunch of kids, sometimes 200. But oh, what's sweet to me and the reason I can't quit is because every time I preach and open the altar, it lines all the way across. And we had our children's camp right in the height of COVID in the month 
uh, of July and not one case of COVID came out of our camp. And we prayed with all those little boogers every night when they came to the altar. They would scoot up next to me. I'd go around and show them how to go to the altar. Some of them didn't know. And I'd kneel with my face toward them and I'd say, come on, if you want Jesus in your life, come on. And here they come. And some of them co scoot up right next to me and one little boy just put his head right up under my arm. He's right here. Sometimes I feel a little hand. And then I feel another one. And another one. And there'll be seven or eight little boys holding one hand. That's the reason I have children's camp because I'm trying to say to another generation, come on, we're going to help you make it. We're going to help you do this. Every church my father pastored, there was somebody there for me. There was somebody there. In one church, it was a Sunday school teacher and a song leader. And every Wednesday night, this little old lady that couldn't sing a lick would lead the Wednesday night prayer meeting singing. She couldn't sing. She sounded like one of those old Magnus chord organs that was out of tune. But she could get God down on the scene. She wouldn't even make it through the, through the song. She'd get her handkerchief out. She'd have to stop. We weren't singing much, but we knew God was there. I needed that when I was in sixth grade. I needed that in those years. I needed that Sunday school teacher. Every church my dad pastored, there was a saint there. There were saints there that pointed me and said, we're going to help you make it. In all of those places, there'd be somebody that'd get on a shout and God would come. And our little crowd, whether it be 30 or 50 or 25, God would come and somebody would get under a burden and lives would be changed. Because the bride is saying, come. Somebody would pray the prayer of healing. I'm just here to tell you tonight, it's a glorious church. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you, it's a glorious church. Trust me on that. And the bride's saying, come. The angels are saying, come. Some dismiss angels as fantasy. The angels swarmed up and down the ladder the night that old Jacob was laying with his head on a rock. He's running from his brother running from all the lies that he'd told. He was a, a awful, an awful boy. He'd committed some terrible sins. He had lied and he had defrauded. But as he laid down his head on that rock that night, God said, you know what? Right there's a boy that I'm going to help right there. He said, angels, get the ladder out. I want you to set the ladder up that goes from heaven to earth. I want to tell you tonight, there's a ladder somewhere in heaven that goes from heaven to earth. Angels began ascending and descending on this thing. And old Jacob... He came up from there and he knew he was a supplanter. He knew he was a cheap liar. He knew that everything in his life was messed up. But that was the day that Jacob changed his life. That was the day that God got a hold of him and made a different man out of him. The angels say, come. David said, the chariot of God, the chariots of God are 20,000 even thousands of angels. An angel in one night slew 80,000 of Sennacherib's troops. You know, we got a lot going on in the world today. President Loper alluded to it earlier. I'm just going to be honest with you. The less I know, the better off I am. I haven't clicked on Fox News on my phone for eight weeks. And I am so much happier a lot of what's on there anyway is speculation. We don't know how much of it's even true. It's, any of these news outlets is like having a sewer pipe. 
you've got an open sewer right here. And I just decided I was shutting the valve off. I'm happier. But you know what? All God would have to do is just send one angel and stop a whole bunch of stuff. He can do it anytime he wants to. The angels are at his command. The world is in communication with God sometimes by the angelic host when a sinner is about to cross the line of worlds. If we could see the demons of hell that are circling his bed and beckoning him to hell. And then if we could see an angel that was sent in those final seconds because his dear mother prayed for him. And God says, Angel, his mama prayed for him her whole life. One more angel. One more time. One more time. And on that deathbed, that sinner repents. It's an amazing thing. It's amazing what happens. The angel of the Lord comes. The angels say, come. Why is the angel there? Because this person was a prayed for person. When my father was a backslider, when I was very young, my I always was carried to church. I was carried to the Evangelical Methodist Church in Shelbyville, Indiana by my mother. My grandmother was a charter member there. And my other grandparents, my father's parents, attended there as well. But at this time in life, when I was born, my parents were backslidden. And, uh, but my mother continued to take me to church because of the fear of God. I was dedicated by A.M. Hamilton. But we moved away from Shelbyville, Indiana to Franklin, Indiana. And at that time, there wasn't an evangelical Methodist church in Franklin. Later, there would be. My aunt and uncle would start one. And the church is still going now. It's ICHA now. Thank, thank God it's still open. Thank God it's still open. But in those days, it wasn't there yet. And so my mother was wondering what we should do but as it were right across the road from our farm they were getting ready to break ground on the first church of the Nazarene right across the road from our pasture do you think that's an accident on that farm right across the road of where First Church sits now. My father was in the barn. There was a Holstein bull in that barn. Holstein bulls are known to be the meanest of all the bulls. My dad was the meanest of all the humans. So mean was meeting mean. My dad would cuss and fuss, chew tobacco. If, a, if an engine wouldn't start, he'd just get a hammer and break the windshield out of whatever vehicle it was. Or he'd beat a motor completely down to nothing if it wouldn't start. I've seen him throw so many fits. One time he, he beat a John Deere elevator motor till it would never, ever run again. And he jumped and he screamed and he hollered and he cussed and fussed. Then he turned around and there was four-year-old me. He fell down in the barn lot took me in his arms. He said, Raleigh, Daddy's going to go to hell for acting like this. I'll never forget it. Not long after that, he went in to get that bowl, and he always took a pitchfork with him. And that day, that bowl wasn't going anywhere, and Dad was determined he was. So Dad took that pitchfork and stabbed the bowl in the nose. Not good. Don't do this at home children watching at home, don't do this. That bull began to froth at the mouth, paw the ground. Dad ran outside. He knew he was in trouble. 
headed toward a John Deere 60 that was sitting there in the barn lot running, but he didn't make it. That bull came up behind that and gored him in the back and threw him as high as this tabernacle into the air and landed him right in the manure or in the mud of the barn lot with a terrible thud. And then before my father could get his wits together, the bull is hanging over him with his face in his face and he's going to tear his ribs out of his rib cage and he began to do that. And my dad had the presence of mind to reach up and get a hold of the bull's horns. And when he did, the bull reared his head back and stood dad right on his feet. And again, dad started heading toward the John Deere 60. And again, the bull came back up and came up behind dad and threw him in the air again. And dad landed in the seat of the John Deere 60. What are the chances of that? And my father said, he, as he looked around that whiteboard fence all the way around that barn lot, he said there were hundreds of angels sitting on the fence. Dad passed out on the tractor. It ran out of gas. Dad didn't come in when Mom rang the dinner bell. She went looking for him, found him slumped over the tractor. They brought him in. Back in those days, they didn't take you to the hospital. They dragged that in. I could hear him screaming. The doctor came to the house. Nazarene preacher came. I couldn't tell much difference between the two. They were both dressed in black. Everybody was whispering. But little me... I was hearing, Daddy's going to go to hell for acting like this, honey. And I stood at the door. I thought any minute somehow that my father would breathe his last breath and he would head into a devil's hell forever without God. That wasn't meant to be. My father lived. And he lived to find himself at the altar in the church of the Nazarene, completely saved, transformed and changed because God said to the angels, go down to Johnson County, Indiana. There's a young man down there that's ran from a call to preach. He's a backslider and he's going to die. Go down there. The angels want you to make it. The angels are bringing bright news from the golden city. They're telling you tonight, good things come for all things are now ready. The great cloud of witnesses is saying, come. You know, don't think it's over when your mama drew her last breath, when grandma drew her last breath. Oh, it's not over. It's just begun. It's just begun. Huh? Her prayers are somewhere in a bottle up in heaven. Uh, I don't know where they keep them. They must have a big place up there where all the bottles are. Uh, and every once in a while God says uh, to the elders that are sitting nearby, Open some of those! And they must pull the stoppers and out come the odors which are the prayers of, of the people of God. And God must say, Answer all those! And a boy gets saved in a revival meeting he wasn't planning to go to. And somebody else gets saved in his truck as he's crisscrossing the country. And somebody else stumbles into a restaurant feeling like nobody cares. And God puts a hole in his person there just in time to talk to him and bring him around. Don't tell me that the prayers of the great cloud of witnesses aren't effectual today because they are. God's people's prayers are drawing interest in heaven and they're apt to be answered any moment. Any moment. Just as the clocks were stopped in the English castle, 
when the queen arrived, signaling the greatest day the castle is known. Even so, the hands on the clocks of your soul will stop at the very hour that the king comes in to fill your life with his power and glory. <laughs> I remember when the clock stopped. I was only nine, but I could cuss like a sailor. I fell in with a Nazarene preacher's boy at school that taught me how to cuss. My dad had already taught me, but it didn't take too good because I was too little. Dad gave me my first chew of tobacco too. Man, I spit that stuff right out the window of the truck. And it ran down the door of that old truck. I'll never forget it. Dad said, I ain't giving you no more of that. You wasted it. Thank God. That boy taught me how to how to lie. Oh, he didn't teach me. I already knew. He taught me how to cover up. We'd go out in that big playground and we'd just cuss and cuss and cuss into the air. And then on Sunday night I'd go to the Nazarene church and Brother Palmer would preach death, hell, and the judgment. Oh, I'd get under such conviction. I opened the altar for him every Sunday night. I needed to go. I got saved every Sunday night. I got saved 3,000 times. But one Sunday night, something happened. Old Raleigh Mitchell was tired of this up and down, one person at school, somebody else at church experience. And I, I, my grandmother just passed away, my mother's mother, and I had her little songbook. And on the back it had Jesus reaching down to get the little lamb. The inspirations songbooks. And I turned it over to some of the songs that Grandma used to sing to me, and I started singing them in my bedroom, in a garret bedroom on a hot August night in 1969. I was just getting ready to turn 10 the next week, and the Holy Ghost came in such power on me with conviction that I, I went down the stairs to my parents' bedroom, and I said, Mom and Dad, I want to get saved. And I just know Dad was saying, yeah, the 3,000th first time. But that night, they faithfully got up. We went in and knelt down in front of the vinyl footstool that we got with top value stamps. And that night, God broke the back of sin in my life. And the clocks on the castle of my soul stopped at 20 minutes after 11. I just want to tell you tonight that Jesus is saying, come. You, we read, we didn't go far enough in Luke. There was too much to tell. But everybody in that little story began to make excuse. They make excuse for missing the greatest meal they was ever going to have. Some are missing it. They've got the invitation, but they've never broken the seal. Jesus says, come. The Spirit says, come. The church, the bride says, come. The angels are saying, come. The great cloud of witnesses are saying, come. Come. All things are ready. Let's stand together. You say, wow, the first night. Don't you know that all of us just came from a great church? We're all saved. We come to GBS. It doesn't matter where you came from or what you're doing. If you've never settled the question, you need to come and do it tonight. If it's just been a little protocol in the past, God can help and break every the power of canceled sin in your life. You can be at GBS for four years and sneak and do and this and that, but I want you to know if you'll get right in on this very first revival uh, and settle it to go with God, you can know in whom you have believed and the clocks on the castle of your soul will stop for the greatest moment your soul has ever known. They put some little stickers on the altar for you here. There's places to kneel. You say, well, Brother Mitchell, I feel like I'm saved, but I know there's things in my life that God's dealing with me about. Well, just come on. There's never a better time to get everything settled than now. 
There's never a better time to do business with God than now. And if people come here tonight, we're just going to have someone's going to, Brother Loper's going to have somebody come and lead in a corporate prayer from the platform. We're not going to get up in your face and give you the COVID. I was just tested and it came out negative. I didn't have any symptoms, but the powers that be determined I was going to have it, love it or live it, and I had it and I'm negative. I'm not going to give you anything, but I want to tell you tonight, I want to give you something. I want to give you fresh hope. I want you to know that no matter where you came from to be in this first semester of school, that Jesus is saying come. And it doesn't matter what it is you're battling with right now in your life. Some of you may have battles with a thing I held up a while ago. It's called a phone. I don't know. Some of you may have other things that's in your life. Uh, and you come to Bible school, you really want God's will in your life, but you know there's things that aren't really settled in your heart. First night wouldn't be a bad time to pray. Anybody have a need tonight? 